I know that you, uh, you know, have a lot of initiatives that you work on throughout the year. But could you tell us a little bit about your office, some of the things that you sure. do? Sure. Uh, that's a good question because I think people really don't know what the Attorney General <laughs> does. Um, we're, first of all, a big law firm. So we're the lawyers for every state university, for every uh, two-year college, uh, community colleges. Uh, we're the lawyers for all the departments, Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Ohio Department of Transportation. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of legal work that, that goes on. So we run a big law firm. Uh, second, we run the state crime lab. Uh, all the things you see on CSI, NCIS, uh, you know, we can actually do those at our, at our crime lab. Crime lab is called BCI. We have three locations. One's in London, Central Ohio. Uh, we have one in Bowling Green. We want to have one in Richfield, which is up by up by Cleveland. Uh, but we do all those things. Maybe it's not as we don't do it within an hour period of time like they do on TV, or maybe it's not quite as glitzy, and you know, we're not uh, talking back and forth with the screen to, to people, but. Uh, all the things they do, pretty much we, we can do. Uh, and there's been a hu huge change in law enforcement uh, since I was a county prosecuting attorney many years ago. You know, if you had a, when I was prosecutor in Greene County, my home county, uh, if you had a rape case and the victim did not know the assailant, maybe it was dark, she could not identify him, uh, unless we got really lucky, uh, we were probably never going to catch that guy. Today, as always, he's left his DNA, but now we have the ability to, to to get his DNA and then go into a national DNA database uh, with known and unknown and see if we can get a match. And many times we do get a match. Okay. We have our monthly um, hour of power with our action business coach, Dave Beam. Um, these, uh, again, are popular meetings with our members. This is, a, this is a small group session. And Dave covers a lot of uh, various business topics. This month's topic is actually going to be 10 ways to improve your business. And who, who wouldn't enjoy that? Next month, the topic will be falling in love with sales. And, uh, you know, most businesses um, um, have sales representatives um, or are engaged in some sort of sales, uh, whether it's uh, services or goods. Uh, so that will be, um, you know, I think a pretty interesting one for our members. I think we've got a uh, video that we want to highlight film of Justin. So I uh, hope you enjoy that, and uh, we'll see you here in just a few minutes. On behalf of Small College Basketball and the Bevo Francis Award Committee, and in partnership with the University of Rio Grande and Sheward Folks Insurance, we now present Justin Pitts, the 2017 Bevo Francis Award. Justin Pitts is a 5'9 junior that led Northwest Missouri State to a magical season, finishing with a 35-1 record and culminating by winning the NCAA Division II National Championship. Pitts averaged 20.9 points, 5.1 assists, 3.5 rebounds, and led the team with 53 steals. He shot over 49% from the field and over 85% from the free throw line. Remarkably, he played 1,267 minutes as the team's primary ball handler and only had 56 turnovers for the entire season. During this junior season, Pitt set the Bearcats' single season record with 754 points and also set the school's career scoring record with 1,929 points. There's sort of a common uniqueness with the people that we have uh, that that support our area, and they all seem to 
be very optimistic. They seem to want to see our community thrive as much as everyone else's. Uh, can I comment on that? No, there's a there's a large group there's, in every community. Uh, there's you know people that always yeah. thinks that it's the worst place on the planet. Yeah. And everybody and we're we're the only ones um, that has any problems, any issues, and most of us ignore people like that. And I can always tell them that you don't like your move. Um, but there's a huge uh, number of people that that um, promote our area. We're very happy living here. Uh, as I say, we have good stuff. Uh, if you want to try to keep up with me for a week, you better put on a really good pair of tennis shoes I and have to lunch because there's a lot going on. We promote the area. We promote our local uh, eateries. The people that do uh, a lot of the local ones, I just ate at a, a new one on Friday, which is called Fusion Grill, and it's a burger and sushi house, so you can go between Mexican meals to sushi and great hamburgers, and so I, I try to eat at all the the, uh, the local places that are new, so I can help promote them. But uh, we have good at we have good activities. We are here with Brad Bass, the Small Business Development Center director. Brad, we have a brief video of one of our clients um, that we're going to play. Uh, it's Lorraine Walker, um, the owner of Silverbridge Coffee Company um, near Gallup Liss. Lorraine, she worked with the Small Business Development Center, I think, with several counselors and over many years. So. Yeah, she's worked with about all the different counselors we've had here at the South Centers on many different aspects of her operation, depending on what her current need was at the time. So right. Lorraine's just an example of, uh, of how people can work with the Small Business Development Center and, and need many different things uh, to help out their company along the journey. Not just starting their business, but once you get started, to grow the one step. And then you have other issues that arise along your, your journey in business ownership. So then you need to address another problem. And then you'll need to address another problem. So uh, Lorraine's really a good, uh, a, a good example, I guess you could say, of how uh, we have many different skill sets within our business team and how that's a client that's been able to utilize every one of those different skills because she's had those needs True. develop along the way. So, so a really exciting story uh, of her company. Tucked in the hills of Gallia County is a gem that will make your mouth water. Chocolate caramel cream, cinnamon sticky bun, dark chocolate cherry. These delicious delights can wrap you in comfort as you start your day. They are part of the pleasurable experience surrounding Silverbridge Coffee. We were lucky if we sold 10 bags a week and now we roast somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 pounds weekly. This family-owned business continues to grow, adding jobs and fueling the local economy. They represent what any entrepreneur can do with hard work and dedication. Lorraine used the resources of the Small Business Development Centers in Piketon to help grow her business from the laundry room in her house to the roasting facility, now home to Silverbridge Coffee. We've worked very closely with them um, through the course of the last six to seven years, um, calling on them for um, advice. You're, you're their biggest cheerleader, you know, to continue them going down that, that path of success. Um, but you try to keep them aware of what may impact that success along the road. While the end product appears effortless, to achieve these smooth and complex flavors, they leave nothing to chance. Like a fine wine, the coffee at Silver Bridge is selected, sampled, and swirled to ensure first-class flavor with every cup. Silver Bridge Coffee is one of 400 businesses helped by the Small Business Development Center at the OSU South Centers in Piketon. This SBDC is ready to help businesses big or small in their 10-county area that stretches from Gallup Police to Brown County. When we see a, a client go from starting their business to success, that is the most rewarding feeling that we have as a, a consultant when we work with a company. One question we have to ask okay. is, we've talked about fraudulent activities and so how does the liability work between the bank, the customer, and the, the merchant um, if something isn't right sure. or something's wrong? Well, Visa and MasterCard both have a um, zero liability policy. So uh, as long as the customer has, uh, or as long as the consumer has um, protected the card to the best that they can, mm -hmm. um, 
from, you know, from anybody that, that would want to um, conduct fraud on the card. And as long as they uh, report the fraud to the financial institution just as soon as it's, it's noticeable, as soon as they recognize mm -hmm. it, then um, there's, like I said, the zero, uh, zero liability policy. Mm -hmm. so, so they're not responsible for any of that fraud. That would fall back uh, on the card issuing institution. So it's 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 designed to um, you know to limit the concern of consumers using cards. Um, you know you've got uh, so, some consumers that may still think the check route is the safest route to go, and um, you know we just want to make sure that they understand that that they can use the card and they're and they're they're not liable for any transaction that they did not conduct with that card. And Correct. with the so. check route. Your account number is right on the check. On, on that's the right. Check. That's so right. That's right. So if you've got, uh, we mentioned earlier about the mm -hmm. uh, the card that if you hand it over to uh, somebody and they've uh, you know, taken that information and, and committed fraud, it's it's really the same as handing a check over to somebody. Sure. And that information's mm -hmm. there as well. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So when we um, have students take our programs and get their certificates and the, their associate's degrees, then they would be broadly classed as industrial technologists or industrial technicians? Uh, yes, we have graduates there. Okay. Their titles vary quite a bit. Okay. Uh, they could be a maintenance technician, uh, they could be an engineering technician, some of them have titles of engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, we can also turn our two-year degree, uh, our two -year, all of our two-year technical degrees, and I forgot to mention there earlier, mm -hmm. that as Chair of Engineering uh, Technologies, we offer programs in fine woodworking, computer science, uh, welding, as well as industrial automation and maintenance, which happens to be my area. Okay. But uh, we're, we're developing a fairly broad set of skills that could work in uh, lots of industries in the region, be it power plant or Kenworth truck or uh, maybe some of the food production manufacturing facilities in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, the skill set they're looking for is, for the most part, universal. Some are looking for specific things, okay. but uh, we hit most of them. I think it's amazing that um, we have a, a, as diverse an array as fine woodworking to computer science to um, this industrial automation kinds of things. So, and all of that's available here. Yes, and at very affordable rates. Very good. Uh, through the community college. Okay. Um, we're going to take a look right now um, at some pictures of students and classes. So, um, as these go by, um, let's talk about this first one here. Um, this what is, is a, this person doing? This is a student, a uh, second year student in my industrial um, automation maintenance program. He's in an electrical troubleshooting course. And we like real world projects. So well, we were fortunate enough to have a real world project to work on here this semester. Mm -hmm. We have a uh, somewhat automated uh, welding ventilation system. And it has a filter array bank. And uh, what Isaiah is doing there is he is uh, installing the connections to mm -hmm. some solenoid valves that are uh, being controlled by a computer. Uh, that blow a reverse airflow. Are all, are all of your programs accredited? You said you have an RN to BSN program and then you have the program that leads yeah. to the RN. Both of our uh, programs are accredited. Our associate degree program just received a visit in the spring and we received a full eight year accreditation. Our next visit will be in 2024. Our BSN program has full accreditation their next visit will be in 2020. They were accredited four years, their visit was four years ago and they received the full eight year accreditation. So our program is well grounded, well marked for the future of this community. We are looking at the needs of our hospitals, of the needs of our community, the needs of our students, so that we can um, be prepared to meet our future needs. That's great because I understand that sometimes those accreditation visits can be a little stressful and I know the Accredi Accreditation Commission for Education and Nursing, which is what ACEN stands for, is a very reputable and very stringent accrediting body and they leave no stone unturned. So the fact that you had a, a site visit that went extremely well and, and you got a full eight years of accreditation really speaks well for the program, the faculty and the administration in that program. Yeah. Um we're very proud of the effort we work did, we have done, mm -hmm. and every one of our faculty worked on this accreditation visit this year. While we did not have any citations that we have to worry about, our faculty are not waiting for eight years to make changes and improvements. This year, they have implemented many different teaching strategies to become more interactive and proactive 
and uh, we look forward to seeing what what they will come up with in the future. Supposedly, when Mr. Antwood died in 1869, his last three words were, Build the college. Build the college. So, Permelia, so they start the college in 1876. Permelia dies in 1885. Your book tells me their relatives filed a lawsuit to break the will, which is fine, and the will is finally upheld 11 years later. 11 years later. So, during that time, was that another time when the college's future was in question, or was it so early and such a young college that that wasn't an issue? Well, the entire. Everything at Rio Grande was paid for originally by Permelia Atwood. So she built the original two buildings, one of which was Atwood Hall. The other was the boarding hall. Rio Grande had not one but two buildings. And all of her funds were used to pay salaries and all sorts of things. And so essentially, had the will been overturned, that source of income would have been gone, and Rio Grande would never survive the first 10 years. Um, I, I call the more I've researched Rye Grant, having been around since 1971, I'm extremely familiar with it. But doing research and reading some things that I've never had access to before, uh, if engineers say bumble bumblebees can't fly, anybody in their right mind would say Rye Grant shouldn't exist because the odds have been defied not once, not twice, not three times, but at least four times. The Atwoods were a childless couple, so the relatives that sued were cousins and uh, sure. nieces and nephews and that sort of thing, not real nuclear not family not type relatives. Yeah. And one of the things about it, you know, one of the things people always question, why is Raya Grant in the middle of nowhere? It's in the middle of nowhere because Pramilia Atwood wanted it in the middle of nowhere. Raya Grant was put here. There was not really a village at the time. There was a post office and a couple of houses. Uh, Raya Grande was put here so that young people would not be influenced by the wicked ways of the city. And especially, these people were very hardcore free will Baptists, and they right. were very anti-alcohol. And they, one of the things you consistently through the early catalogs and the advertising and everything, is that there are no there are no saloons in the in the area. Okay. So it's very important. Right. And, b and besides, the Atwoods owned the land on which everything right. was built. The original 10 acres, yeah. right. The original right. 10 acres. Yeah. 